and Frank McDougall Memorial Lecture at the FAO headquarters in Rome. Francis Mendy was listening and he now tells us more. He has seen it all, walked the corridors of power, meeting with world leaders and joining efforts to find solutions to the myriad of problems the international community was grappling with during his tenure. But now he's taking on a new challenge, helping the world produce enough food to fill the ballooning population. Ladies and gentlemen and dear friends, I understand that some of my, I understand that some of my former colleagues were bemused and a little amused when I announced at my, my decision to get involved with agriculture when I stepped down as Secretary General. I can see why the move from a Secretary General to Farmer Kofi was met with smiles. <laughs> it was perhaps not the most obvious choice for me, but I know this audience, above anyone else, understands both the seriousness and the challenge and the urgency of finding solutions. The former top international civil servant began his lecture with touch on rising food prices, long-term trends, challenges for the FAO and benefits that come with higher food prices, with a suggestion that food and nutrition continue to rely at the heart of the injustice that encouraged the founding fathers of the FAO to conceive the arm of the United Nations tasked with the responsibility of ensuring there is enough food to feed the world. Rising food prices, Kofi Annan continued, have also brought greater competition from heavily subsidized agro or biofuels. The board chairman of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa also identified the unsustainable exploitation of dwindling water resources as a factor responsible for the two thirds cut in grain produced in Saudi Arabia. The global population has just passed 7 billion. The latest report from the UN Population Division was that numbers may not stabilize at 9 billion, as it forecast only two years ago, but could reach 10 billion. At the same time, greater prosperity in developing countries will see 3 billion people move up the food chain, an expanding middle class with a growing appetite for meat and dairy products. Grain once used to feed people, it's increasingly being switched to feeding animals. The increase in food prices is widely blamed for some of the food-related problems confronting the world. But Anand is of the view that the extraordinary way in which they have risen is to blame. But the phenomenon is also a blessing in disguise, according to the former UN boss. He said, although the suggestion may be controversial in some quarters, there is a strong case to be made that food prices have to be rebalanced, provided volatility is tackled and the vulnerable protected. Africa was left out in the Green Revolution that liberated Asia from the clutches of hunger and malnutrition. But the continent, according to Annan, has the potential to be a great cereal producer. To all these pressures on our food supplies, we must add the catastrophic impact of climate change with this effect on temperature, rainfall, productivity of land, and the frequency of extreme weather. Kofi Annan reminded his audience with comprised delegates from a good number of countries that the future of the continent's one billion most vulnerable people depends on answers to the worrying hunger situation and the tenacity of individuals and groups working to turn things around. Francis Mending, GRTS. You can also follow that story and other GRTS programs live on our website. That is at www.grts.gm. There you can also monitor GRTS radio live. We're going to take a short break. The news continues in just a moment. Welcome back to GRT's News to News out of the Gambia. Now, police in Norway are still trying to establish whether the suspected terrorist who went on a shooting spree on Friday acted alone. This after documents posted on the internet reveal he planned the attacks as far as 2009. The shooting said to be the worst terrorist attack in the history of the largely peaceful Scandinavian country left almost 100 people dead. Questions are meanwhile being asked about the efficiency of the police after they failed to respond to the attack on the island, which lasted 90 minutes. Let's look at this report for more on that. 
While the country mourns the victims of the double terrorist attack on Friday, Norwegian police are investigating whether the killer, Anders Bering Breivik, truly acted alone as he claims. He had, has admitted that he was responsible for the bomb attack and for the killing of those people out on the island. He say, says that uh, he was acting alone, but we have to make sure that that's true, that his version is true. According to police, Mr. Breivik began planning the attack in 2009. A few hours before the massacre, he posted a 1,500-page document on the Internet in which he berated Muslim immigrants and multiculturalism and declared himself a follower of the Knights Templar, a medieval Christian brotherhood which fought in the Crusades. He told his lawyer that he had chosen Utoya Island to warn the Norwegian government to change its policies. Mr. Brevik said he surrendered to police after running out of ammunition. He didn't shoot crazy, he shot to kill, uh, actually, and uh, I still see the picture in my head when people are running and falling because they get uh, shot uh, while trying to escape. It's, it's very, very strong emotions. Many of the victims hid in the forest. Others threw themselves in the water in an attempt to swim to safety. Why it took police so long to respond is also under investigation. The shooting spree lasted nearly an hour and a half. Utoya lies 30 kilometers from Oslo and can be reached by boat in 20 minutes. 92 people died in the combined bomb attack and massacre. 97 were injured. Several victims are still missing. Two trains have collided in China barely a month after Beijing launched its high-speed train service. The accident, which claimed the lives of 40 people, is being attributed to power failure. Clashes between police in Egypt and demonstrators at the now-famous Tahrir Square have now left over 200 people with injuries. The recent upsurge of violence follows attempts by angry protesters to storm the headquarters of the ruling military council. We have more on these and other stories in this roundup of news. Over 40 people were killed and 200 injured when a high-speed train derailed in China. The crash happened when a train hit a second one which had stopped on a bridge after a power failure. When they collided, several carriages fell off the line. The accident happened less than a month after the opening of the new high-speed link between Beijing and Shanghai. Chinese rail authorities ordered an urgent overhaul of safety measures. In Egypt, the latest round of clashes between anti-government protesters and security forces left at least 200 injured. Tens of thousands of people joined demonstrators who've been occupying Cairo's Tahrir Square, attempted to march on the headquarters of the Interim Military Council. Police fired into the air to disperse the crowd. Military chiefs have accused the radical April 6 movement of trying to drive a wedge between the people and the army. In Yemen, the anti-government protests are continuing. Thousands demonstrated in Sana'a to renew their call for the exit of President Ali Abdullah Saleh, who's been hospitalized in Saudi Arabia since early June, when he was injured in a bomb blast. In the south of the country, nine soldiers, including a colonel, were killed when a suicide bomber set off a bomb outside an army camp. Before we end the news recap of the top stories now, government has ventured into the lucrative but competitive fossil fuel retail business with the setting up of the Gambia National Petroleum Company. Former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan is calling for urgent action to ensure the availability of enough food for the world's teeming population. Law enforcement officers in Egypt have repelled an attempt to storm the headquarters of the ruling military council by an angry mob. And the efficiency of Norway's police force has come under the spotlight after reports suggesting it took officers an hour and a half to respond to Friday's shooting spree. You can also follow that story and other GRTS programs live on our website. That is at www.grts.gm. And there you can also monitor GRTS radio live. That is on in the news. But stay tuned for the continuation of the repeat broadcast of the 2011 edition of the Miss July 22nd Scholarship Beauty Persian. Good night. Let me go.